Thank you very much. I think I got a few accolades I don't have, but I'm not going to correct that now. <laughs> um, I'm uh, delighted to be here. Uh, I feel a little bit like an imposter, though, because even though I have a PTC um, certificate, which I got two years ago in Norway, I'm not really a part of this community, but I'm a delighted to become a part of, of what you're all doing, because I think it's very important. I would like to bring into this room uh, Hildur Jackson, who many of you know, who passed away last weekend. She was the uh, founder of the Gaia Trust with her husband, Ross and is uh, very much behind uh, the Global Eco Village Network and the uh, Eco Village Design uh, Education materials. She would have been delighted to be here and to see how many of you uh, have come across uh, the world to discuss permaculture as a solution for uh, both uh, Earth and people which she cared about intensely. He doesn't want to go from the screen. <laughs> she was also a spiritual leader, so who knows? She may be here. What I have discovered since I um, got out of my box of geochemistry in the year 2000, learning about sustainability issues, is that we could say that the earth is shrinking. In the year 1900s, when we had approximately one and a half billion people on this earth, each one of us had about, uh, just under eight global hectares uh, to support uh, the food and the waste and, and our consumption. Now, we have over three, uh, 7 billion people and we have less than 2 global hectares. And collectively, we are using one and a half Earths uh, every year, as the Global Footprint uh, Network um, has calculated. So, of course, this is uh, what is causing the crisis we all face today. We have surpassed uh, planetary boundaries as defined by scientists and collaboration with the Stockholm uh, Resilience Institute. And uh, the, of the nine global boundaries they defined, we have surpassed three. And that is biodiversity loss, uh, climate change, and the nitrogen cycle. So it doesn't matter where we look, all the curves look the same. They're all exponential growth curves, whether it is population, GDP, uh, urban population, or number of McDonald's restaurants. In, in the time from 1750 to 2000, uh, 2000, we have exponential growth. So we do need a new framework. And as I started looking into what a geologist could do, I, I understood that it was not enough just to look at um, nature, we needed to look at other issues. And indeed, um, Kenneth Bolting stated in the 1950s, anyone who believes that unlimited growth is possible in a limited world is either a madman or an economist. <laughs> now, I've, I've in insulted a few economists at that, uh, where I repeat this, but his uh, he could say it because he was an economist. Um, and his colleague uh, in the next building, also at the University of Boulder, he has stated many times, and he still is stating this, the greatest imperfection of mankind is that it does not understand the consequences of exponential growth. And this is a fact 
that most people don't understand. And this is something we need to address in the education system. And we need a new framework. When I started looking into well, what is sustainability all, all about, I was very happy to find this framework or a compass from my friend Alan Atkinson, who is a sustainability uh, change leader. So north is for nature, east is for the economy, south is for society, and west is uh, for the well-being of people. So we need all of these in balance in order to have a sustainable world. And we could p plot the ethics um, of the permaculture movement uh, onto this. Uh, so you see there the earth care, the fair share, and the people care, or they fit into the compass. Now, what I'm going to talk about, I also fitted that into a compass to, to avoid these bullet points. Um, what I have, where I have been working in the last 15 years, and what I will talk about today um, is uh, uh, the availability of natural resources and how long they will last and how they are linked to the economy and what sort of new economic systems we need. Uh, I will also talk about the sustainable development goals and how uh, a society might look like that achieves these goals. At the basis of our economy are our natural resources. So you could say that energy plus phosphorus or oil plus phosphorus uh, creates uh, food and people. And this is uh, then through work, we can turn this into uh, wealth. And on top of this wealth, we can have a creative bubble uh, of arts and so on. But without these resources, we cannot have an economy. We can look at this as a, an ecosystem. So the first level, or the first, um, uh, the primary production then is the energy food that creates the people, and then the secondary production is the work, and the third uh, level or tier is uh, the civilization. So how um, can we then look into how long uh, we can, continue to have the uh, economic system that we have today um, into the future. Because until now, we have had plenty of resources. I'm having trouble with this stuff here. So over the past few years, I've been working with Harald Sverdrup, uh, a Norwegian um, uh, engineer uh, who uh, who is also interested in sustainability issues, and we have been analyzing over 40 different natural resources and how long they will last. It's a very similar to the work of uh, Dennis and Daniela Meadows and their colleagues um, in uh, Limits to Growth, which was published in 1972. And if we analyze where we are now, we have followed the standard run, um, uh, which was one of the scenarios they they looked into, which was business as usual. We, have, we are right on track, which is uh, not good, as you will say. But in their analysis, they run um, energy and all the resources together uh, and looked into the consequences of population growth and, and, and the use of these resources. In our analysis, all the res resources are separated because the computer uh, capacity is now much bigger. They run their model, it took three weeks at the biggest computer in the US at the MIT, but we can run it on our laptop. So this is what our computer technology has done for us in over 40 years. Um, this uh, issue just came out, it's over 200 page paper in uh, geochemical perspectives and it's uh, available online for those who are interested. So can we have, um, unlimited growth. This is a logarithmic plot. So those of you who remember maths, um, if we take the logarithm of an exponential curve, you get a straight line. So you have a, you know, several straight lines here that show somewhere between 3 and 7% uh, growth rate in annual uh, production from 1900 until 2010. And you can see that these curves 
continue to rise and rise and rise. And what you need to remember is that for each doubling time, uh, if it's 7% then the doubling time is 10 years, uh, then that, that production is more than all the other doubling times before. So if you can think that this can continue forever, then we will start um, uh, mining the, uh, into the, the uh, large part of the mass of the Earth, and of course that's not possible. And indeed, uh, all of you know about peak oil. We have passed peak oil. We are about to pass peak coal which means that we will pass peak energy because we can never have as much renewable energy um, as uh, the cheap oil that we have had. So, um, and the reason why the curves uh, come to a maximum is because we have a, if you think about this as a Coke bottle, you know, you start sucking and you start suck, sucking and all of a sudden you have consumed half of it and then you will empty it. And that is exactly what is happening here. So it will we, we reach a maximum and then we go down on the other end and these are the resources which are much more difficult to get uh, and more expensive. And this is um, Colin Campbell, uh, an oil geologist, demonstrated peak oil with Guinness in Ireland. He, he invited me to a conference in Ireland last year saying, here I am, I, I want to make all my data about oil public. Please come and see whether we can do this together with all the other resources. So it uh, doesn't matter how we complain, this is where we are. We, we have consumed half of the oil. And this is the same for all the other resources that we have looked at. We have either reached peak production or we will reach it very soon most of them before 2030. And we know pretty well how much uh, is available of these resources. And this is very well collated both by mining companies uh, and various geological surveys, uh, surveys uh, including the US Geological Survey. So you can see among these is peak phosphate, which is what we use for fertilizer, uh, and peak soil. And this is why permaculture is so important, because we have used and destroyed, we have destroyed half of our soils and we will not have industrial fertilizers uh, much into the future because it will be too expensive for most people to use. And if we look um, into, if we have business as usual, how long will these re use, uh, resources last? These are over 40 resources. Everything that's red will be consumed up within the next uh, 100 years. If it's orange, it's 100 and 200, uh, between 100 and 200 years. If it's light orange, it's up to 1,000 and so on. And you can see it's only over 10,000 years when it gets dark green. So the only way to do that is by, is by recycling, and we are not very good at that. If we recycle 50%, uh, you can see they last a bit longer. 90%, even more longer, 95. Now we get into, into thousands of years for most. Uh, and then if we decrease the population by half, even longer, this is just a scenario, okay? <laughs> To show that population is important, like Jonathan Pottit said today, it's always the elephant in the room, nobody wants to talk about population, but it is important. Here, is, here we have half the population and uh, half the consumption we have. So the consumption level and population level and the recycling uh, will uh, uh, can tell us how long these uh, resources can last. Now, it would be nice if we thought that by consuming all these resources, uh, we, we have generated a, a good societies. But what do we find? Well, we've had GDP rising, yoo hoo! <laughs> uh, but the genuine progress indicator, which takes away all the bodies, the environmental and societal you know, destructions, and adds on voluntary work and so on, 
has, has sort of leveled, if not gone down, since uh, the 1970s. So GDP is not a very good indicator for the success of nations. And if we look at uh, this, most of the GDP since the early 70s when oil peaked in the United States has been built on debt. So we've been raising debt so that we can show that we are having um, GDP growth. And we have created societies with incredible inequalities between countries, but also within countries. We have a financial system on steroids where the GDP uh, globally is 63 trillion, but 600 trillion are traded as futures and derivatives. So those are the future resources which probably don't exist. <laughs> and in currency trading. So this, this whole system is operating legally and gambling with our money. You know, I, was, I looked at some uh, financial paper this morning that I picked up at, at the train station and uh, there, there's, there are shaky markets all over the place. So when, when we will have the, the next collapse, I don't know, but it might be soon. Now, in unequal societies, we also have uh, m many more societal problems. So here we have the USA and Portugal and UK, which are very unequal. And we have very high health and societal problems. Whereas countries with, with, with low inequality, like Japan and, and the Scandinavian countries, have many, have lower uh, societal problems. And also, if you look at the happiness of people since the, since the 50s, um, it hasn't really changed, maybe gone down, uh, but the, the income level has gone up. So money doesn't make us happy. You already knew that. <laughs> so how did we get here? We've had this very linear way of thinking. We, we dig up a resource like phosphorus, we make fertilizer, we dump it on the farm and it goes into a river and causes algal blooms and, and death zones in, in rivers and oceans. And we have had this industrial system which had 100% coming from a mine and going through society and then to a dump. So 100% and 100% goes lost. But now what we need to do is to recycle. If we recycle, then this is the, the basis of the circular economy that the EU is no, now working towards. And in, in industry, we need to learn from nature and, and, and create industries um, that, uh, that use the waste of another industry uh, for their production. So this is all possible. We just have to put our mind to it. So what we are doing, we are uh, building a world model um, like I said before, similar to limits to growth, but much more detail. We have population and economy and resources and a food module and an ecological module. And this is all uh, the, the, the results so far uh, can be found in this issue I, I talked about before. So resources are very much at the base of the economy and we need to remember that. We have tested our model back to the Roman times, just to, to see that there is some rig, academic rigor behind this. So you can see that here we have the amount of silver and coins in Rome. This is, these are the actual numbers. And then this is our model, modeling um, the relative Roman army, army size and, and, and cash flow in coinage and so on. So we can actually predict um, these crashes, we have been able to predict, you know, the, the fall of the of the Russian Empire and the and and the British Empire was the must dismantle just before it collapsed. Maybe they knew what they were doing. I don't know. <laughs> so, in 2012, I got this incredible email from from the Prime Minister of Bhutan, um, signed by the King, and I almost hit delete but decided maybe I should open it. And I was invited to the United Nations to discuss with many hundred sustainability uh, experts 
how we could put the gross national happiness measure of, of, um, um, uh, of Bhutan, which is an indicator that they use uh, instead of GDP, into the Sustainable Development Goals. We didn't quite achieve that, although we did send a report to the United Nations because um, government in Bhutan changed and the new, new prime minister didn't think that gross national happiness was so important, maybe GDP was important after all. So this is how politics can, can um, change things. But we, uh, a group of us formulated the Alliance for Sustainability and Prosperity and we have been writing papers together. This one came out in, uh, in Nature last year and, and the geoscientist sort of uh, looking at how a society could look that is uh, committed to the sustainable development goals. And basically, of course, we need to live within the Earth's support system uh, and we, um, within that we need to have society and the economy uh, uh, within these boundaries. Yeah, not the other way around as it, as, as it is today. And so the ultimate goal would then be uh, a sustainable, prosperous and equitable well-being for humans and the rest of nature. And we could, use, we could do that by uh, including all the capital aspects of nature, the built human and social. This is, these are uh, ecological economics principles we would then uh, uh, have a new development uh, paradigm that aims for ecological sustainability and fair distribution, regenerative economy and living democracy. Uh, we would meet all human needs. Uh, we, could, we, we would make sure that, you know, if necessary, we would teach um, um, happiness skills and then this goal could be reached. And... Um, Some of our writing has been in the journal Solutions, which I've, if you don't know about that, then that's a hybrid academic um, uh, journal magazine which has uh, solutions for sustainable societies. And in the latest issue, there was something about permaculture. So uh, that might be, an, uh, might be an issue you might want to look at. And we have sort of classified the, the different uh, targets. There are 17 targets in the Sustainable Development Goals. Um, and then there are, I'm, I'm sorry, there are 17 goals that are over 100 targets and, and how, uh, how they are linked with the natural, social and, and economic uh, capitals. And we have come up with something that we call the Republic of Wellbeing uh, or the Gelato Society. <laughs> and this was in the, in the Guardian last week. Uh, I think it was on the 2nd of September. So why the Gelato Society? Well, we have two Italians amongst us. Everybody likes ice cream. And we would then uh, make sure uh, that the, um, the ecological life support system is the cone uh, and society and econ economy would be in balance. Who wouldn't want to live in the Gelato Society? <laughs> So, uh, how does that look? You know, I put that also into the com compass. Uh, we, would, we would work on nature regeneration, um, the regenerative economy, uh, business would have environmental respon uh, responsibility, uh, nature would have human rights, as already in Bolivia, Ecuador, and New Zealand. Uh, we would map out the environmental and, and, and economic effects of electoral programs. We would have sustainability in the constitution, a living democracy, uh, and, and, and be committed to the SDGs. Um, and we would aim for ecosystem and human well-being. I welcome all of you to this new society. Um, we have, however, come to, to see that it's, it's complicated to get there because some of the goals may, may interfere with the others. 
So we are now doing, I have a, a, a student working with me and, and Harald Sverdrup doing systems analysis on the goals and, and all the targets. So this is basically how the world works. Here we have the resources and the metals and materials. Then here we have the society and I mapped the goals on top of this. Um, and what struck us straight away was that natural resources aren't really within these goals and neither is uh, equality or corruption and social trust. So there's something missing there that we need to point out to those who want to achieve these goals. The ideal ethical principles for the Republic of Wellbeing are of course the permaculture ones. <laughs> Earth care, fair share and people care. And there are many hopeful signs, you know, there's lots going on, and for, so I'm the optimist. Uh, the, the EU is aiming for the circular economy, there's a huge degrowth movement going on in the French and Spanish-speaking world of, of Europe. China has now a new constitution, and in that we have an ecological society they want to build up. There are parallel currencies coming up everywhere. Uh, there are different economies sharing solidarity and service economies. Um, and then, of course, we have the transition towns and eco-villages and permaculture. We're all hopefully going in the right, right direction. And people are claiming the, the, um, the, the, the rights of the commons uh, through, for example, the initiative of claiming the sky. That is, we should claim the atmosphere as ours. And, and, and sue companies that are, there are 90 companies only that put out 70% of the CO2 and the greenhouse gases, so that's fairly easy to do. Join us, please, sign it on a vase. We have young people uh, suing their governments in the Netherlands and the US and winning, and, and, the, and the courts are telling governments that they have to um, uh, look uh, think about young people and their future and, and curb emissions. Um, we have the eradicating ecocide uh, initiative in, in Britain. And finally, I'm a geologist. I've been thinking about the link between resources and, and, and economics for the last five years since I came back to Iceland in 2008 and I thought I have to understand what's going on. Here we have a whole economy crashing, you know, what was going on. And now I've got just my latest funding is to train 12 PhD students in new economic thinking. So if any of you in here have a master's degree or know anybody who has a master's degree who wants to train in, in, in systems analysis and new economic thinking, please apply. Deadline is next week. Okay, so the, for, for the Republic of Wellbeing, um, permaculture ethics are absolutely at the core. Resources, resources from the basis of our economy. Um, we need to close the inequality gap and focus on corruption. Um, and the economic system is undergoing changes. Uh, it's going from complex and, and often corrupt to global uh, and global to simpler and ethical and local. So thank you very much.